no son desvelo me de no lo si dupu rosoli honesti posen totelos in this video we're going to take some time with another dimension of the roots of the ancient Greek polis uh, through the lens of cultural philosophical memory, which is Delphi, literally dolphins, the city of the Mount Parnassus region, which is uh, the seat of the oracle or the Pythia. We've talked about the oracle from different perspectives before, but we'll focus a little bit more on the site of Delphi and the practices that flourished there in this conversation. So in some of the themes we'll explore, we'll spend some time with the memory of Delphi in later Greece, with its uh, influence on the Panhellenic or all Greek sense of the polis as an institution that is the city-state, some of the ways that Delphi plays a part in ancient Greek myth with the characteristically connected gods Apollo and Dionysus, as well as ecstatic ritual, the site of Delphi itself, um, the process of the consultation of the oracle, and finally, something of what we could call the philosophy of Delphi, um, the maxims associated with uh, the Pythia and with the temple, and some of the philosophers and legislators who were especially associated with the site of Delphi. Our focus here temporally is a little later than our last conversation. We're moving forward in time to about 800 BC, down to the classical period, uh, the archaic and classical periods covering a few hundred years around the birth, as it's sometimes considered, of the polis or city-state. Here we are in the, the beautiful mountain range, uh, the slopes of Parnassus, where Delphi was situated, nestled above the Atean plain below. The site is also sometimes called Pytho and is the site of the Pythia, an association with some of the beings who were said to be there quite early on, we also have the word python relating to the great serpent. Uh, we're again focusing here primarily on the time from the 8th century BC, but there may be roots of the oracle earlier, as we suggested in our previous conversation about the Bronze Age. Here we are, uh, just to situate us in space, a little bit north of Mycenae, which we talked about last time, uh, and also a little bit northwest of Athens, which we'll be coming to next time. This is an image of the, uh, the theater at Delphi, uh, which was a seat of all kinds of cultural activity, uh, drama, as well as sport. And we might start with this story. It's a legend about Zeus. And this is actually a retelling in a, a modern book, uh, the first volume of uh, a set of descriptions of oracles given by the Pythia at Delphi. And it's about Zeus. So according to the legend, Zeus one time wanted to figure out exactly where the center of the earth was. From another point of view, he's finding the core of his own grandmother, uh, Gaia. So he released two eagles from opposite ends, of the world, opposite ends of the world. They flew together. They met right in the middle over Delphi and proved it was the midmost, midmost point. Accordingly, in early Greek maps, Delphi occupied the exact center. And there's a certain symbolic truth to that, as the authors describe from the point of view of the Hellenes or Greeks at that time. Delphi, in a way, became the spiritual center of the Hellenic world. Um, there might be lots of other dimensions in which other city-states were particularly important. Sparta's military hegemony, uh, Athens as a center of education, Alexandria later. But for all that, as a pan-Hellenic center, as a place where all the Hellenes or Greeks found common ground. Delphi was hardly rivaled. Uh, Olympia as a center for sport, as the site of Mount Olympus, also a major Panhellenic center. There are other kind of spiritual touchstones like this, but the story of Delphi being the center of the world as found by Zeus carried a certain resonance that, in a way, was never really surpassed. Though the site of Delphi and the oracle at the temple is particularly important, uh, even earlier in a way, it's, it's about the cave in the mountain. This is the Carician cave, uh, again associated with some of the imagery we've talked about earlier of the ecstatic ritual dance and vision in the wooded wilds of the mountainside. We can remember as well Rhea's son Zeus being born in a mountain and protected by her uh, as the mountain mother. Uh, secreting him away in a cave. 
But this cave seems to have been a center of important life uh, very early on, and then ritual activity associated with Delphi throughout much of the historical period, and is worth flagging that in a way it's part of the spiritual heart of the core that Delphi is. To give us a sense of time, uh, there's human occupation at the cave I just showed you, the Carician Cave in the Stone Age, the Neolithic period, as early as 4300. When we move into the Bronze Age, which we talked about again a little more in the last video, in the third millennium down to the second millennium BC, we know there's occupation in the plain below Delphi, which is a fair ways up the mountain, um, by about 1400, uh, contemporary with some of those events at Knossos we were talking about earlier, uh, there's a young human community forming at the sanctuary at Delphi. And we know during uh, the run-up to the late Mycenaean period, we're already finding uh, traces of female figurines at the later Athena and Gaia sanctuary at Delphi, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So signs of Mycenaean worship with this kind of uh, background of perhaps uh, Minoan belief as well, though it's always a little bit difficult to single out where these elements connect. After that, as you might remember, there's a, a post-Bronze Age break or collapse leading into what's sometimes called the Dark Ages, again, at least dark to us, partly because of a lack of evidence to work from. Um, there's some local occupation at Delphi in the 9th century, but we're really getting into the, uh, the heyday of Delphi with the dawn of the polis in the Archaic period. Uh, at this point, there seems to be some growingly international Pan-Hellenic connections developing across many Greek polis or city-states, and there's some evidence for trade in Delphi pretty far away, Scandinavia and Italy. There's also some evidence for the practice of the oracle, the prophet, uh, the central priestess of Delphi by the 8th century or earlier. This is a much later imagining from the 19th century of the priestess at Delphi, but it also picks up some of the ways that the image of the Pythia was uh, received in uh, later times as well, which is important in how we understand perhaps perceptions coming from the modern age, and I'll talk about that a little later as well. So by the 8th or 7th century, there is growing evidence for city-states that consult the oracle when they're making public decisions. Um, and individual consultations also seem to have become relatively common. The oracle was consulted in the foundation of new cities by many Greek city-states. Again, it's a kind of meeting place for many of them. There's some celebrated consultations, like with Croesus of Lydia, and advice offered for the Persian-Greek War, as well as the Peloponnesian-Athenian War in the classical period in the 5th century. And there were a number of battles for control of Delphi. Uh, Athens played a significant role in reclaiming Delphi in one of those battles. There was also an important cultural role played by Delphi. Uh, examples include in the 6th century uh, some sporting events, the Pythian Games. It's important to recognize that sport wasn't only a game, but was a time, at least in these major sporting events like the Olympics and the Pythian Games, when no cities were fighting at war. Often the polis uh, did find themselves at war, so this time of peace was important. Uh, it also provided a kind of groundwork for a common calendar. Many of the city-states had their own independent calendars, which could get pretty confusing. Uh, already by the 6th century, there is some sign, at least again in later cultural memory, that philosophers were associated with the institution of the Pythia at Delphi. Pythagoras, you might notice, even has Pythia in his name. That's sometimes been commented on. Uh, he's the one behind the famous theory, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The square's area on the hypotenuse of the right angle triangle is equal to the areas on the other two sides. Uh, but he's got many more ideas than that. He's a really important philosopher morally as well in the development of Greek religion and metaphysics with a philosophical flavor. And Heraclitus, the shadowy or mysterious philosopher, who we'll be talking about soon too. In the 5th and 4th century, uh, the oracle seems to become increasingly important for personal religion as well, and personal life. Socrates and Plato are pretty good examples of this. Here's an ancient depiction of the oracle to place alongside this 19th century reimagining, uh, which again we'll spend a bit more time with thinking about how Victorians and folks in the early 20th century tried to make sense of the phenomenon of this powerful woman uttering prophecies and shaping the lives and thought of philosophers. 
Uh, on the left-hand side here, you can see an image of Themis, the Titan, uh, seated in the position of the oracle on the famous tripod of Delphi uh, with a pillar and being consulted by a Greek hero, Gaius, looking into the water like a mirror to see the future or the truth of the question being posed and bearing a laurel, uh, sometimes associated with purification. Uh, so that gives a sense of how the Pythia is perceived or the oracle is perceived in the classical period in the fifth century. Next, let's spend a little bit of time thinking about how Delphi is represented in Greek myth. So the gods of Delphi. Uh, two of the particularly important gods are Apollo and Dionysus. But before we come to them, they're not the first gods to inspire the oracle. We actually start with Earth, Gaia. Again, remember, Delphi is conceptualized, at least later, as the omphalos, or the navel of the Earth, that place where Zeus's eagles met. According to the Pythia, speaking as a character in the tragedy The Eumenides, staged by the great Athenian playwright Aeschylus in the 5th century, the first prophet was Earth. After her came the Titan Themis, and third was uh, Phoebe, uh, literally the shining one. And she gave the oracle's place as a birthday gift to uh, her grandson, Apollo, sometimes called Phoebus, also the shining one. Uh, as we know from the Homeric hymn, Apollo came to this region, Zeus inspired his heart with prophetic skill, and he speaks the unerring will of Zeus. So we have a sequence of gods of the oracle. We start from Earth or Gaia, who's a primordial goddess, as you might remember from our discussion of Hesiod. Uh, after Earth, we have Themis, who's a titan from the next generation. Uh, then Phoebe, the shining one, whose grandson Apollo inherits the oracle. Uh, but Apollo is the god of the oracle, inspiring the Pythia for nine months of the year. Uh, for the remaining months of the year, it's Dionysus. To say a little bit about Apollo's presence, uh, and then a little bit about Dionysus's presence, um, first, uh, there is one tradition where Apollo inherits the oracle in this peaceful way and cooperates with Themis in receiving it. We have a number of authors who attest to that general outline, like Aeschylus, Pausanias, and Ephorus, there's another tradition according to which um, the key event is Apollo's violent, not exactly usurpation, but taking over of the oracle by the slaying of a monstrous python, uh, a serpentine monster. Uh, Euripides tells this story, for example. There's a version of it in the Homeric hymn to Apollo. And according to Plutarch, uh, again, a later Platonist author, it's followed by a period of Apollo's purification for this act. So there's these two different traditions to understand how Apollo comes to be god at the oracle and how he takes on his characteristic role as prophet god. Uh, one natural interpretation would be that a cult of Apollo came and uh, usurped an earlier cult of a titan or of earth at the site, which was in a way symbolically guarded by the python. However, there's also a perspective according to which Apollo already belongs to that earlier substratum to, we could say, the sort of Minoan tradition that comes with the Cretan sailors uh, to Delphi from Knossos, uh, representing something like the young god, the healing god of the dance and the harvest celebration uh, from Crete. On that view, which we can also find in a way in the Homeric hymn, this whole tradition might already be at least a distant resonance or reflection of an earlier Minoan story, uh, something associated with the Cretan Zeus, who is also deeply associated with Dionysus. And that brings us to the other three months of the year. Uh, Dionysus is a god of ecstasy and wine and madness who inspires the Menads who dance on the mountain in the Carician cave we looked at before. And he's also sometimes recognized, uh, or it's suggested he could be like the dying and rising god uh, um, identified, for example, in the work of, of Fraser, uh, often questioned today, at least as a very broad uh, category, but certainly in some way present with uh, some of the Orphic figures in early Greek religion. At Delphi, the saying has it that Dionysus' grave as a god was at the temple of Apollo, um, perhaps beneath the Pythia herself as she gave her oracles. 
And in a way, on one interpretation, he is reborn every year, nurtured in the cave, the Carician cave again, just as Zeus was on Crete. Uh, and during those three months of the year, as the light is returning to the world, so too Dionysus returns. There's a famous balance between Apollo and Dionysus. Of course, Apollo is the god of music and cultural memory and light and the sun and healing and prophecy. Dionysus is the god of wine and madness and dance. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher, famously drew this kind of contrast between the two of them as very different figures in an important, uh, in an important way. But at Delphi, in a sense, they, they seem to represent two sides of the same coin. Uh, the inspiration of the oracle for prophecy is so deeply entwined with the notion of the madness and ecstasy of the visionary dance, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to pull them apart. Uh, in fact, uh, in the later Temple of Apollo, um, at the site of Delphi, Apollo is represented on one side, one pediment, and Dionysus on the other. So part of the mystery of Delphi, perhaps, is the depth of this association. So that's a little bit about the gods at Delphi. Uh, there's more in some of the materials that come with the video, but let's just take a little bit of time to talk about the site itself, moving from myth to, to history and material culture. Uh, one of the most important elements, of course, is the whole complex of the sanctuary of Apollo itself, with the sacred way where pilgrims would usually visit and spend most of their time. And you can see something of the vibrancy and sophistication of the complex in this 1894 reconstruction. Um, it's uh, uh, relatively well preserved today after a major reconstructive effort by French archaeologists in the late 19th century. We know something about the plan of the Sanctuary of Apollo II, and the Adaton marked here in this plan is likely the Holy of Holies where the Pythia, the oracle herself, gave her prophecies to all those city-states and individuals who came for questions, and also where that famous know thyself might have been inscribed on the cella on the way in. So that's a bit about the sanctuary of Apollo. But this did not displace that earlier worship of Earth. And in fact, the sanctuary of Athena, uh, Pronia, or before the temple of Apollo, also seems to have served as a sanctuary of Earth, of Gaia. That's down here, marked E on the map. Um, and it's the site of some of the most famous uh, structures we see at Delphi today, if you go to visit, uh, including the mysterious round building, the Tholos. We have no idea, really, what this building was for. It might have been associated with the worship of Gaia. If you think of that image of the navel, the belly button of the world of Gaia uh, at Delphi, it's possible that the roundness is significant in some way, religiously, conceptually, but it could also have this shape for administrative and other reasons. Historically, we don't know, but again, in terms of this resonance of cultural memory, it's helpful to remember that, in fact, Gaia was not displaced at this site. The worship we find, perhaps, with those Mycenaean figurines of the goddess are still very much present. So... A lot of this leads up to what it was all about, consulting the Pythia herself, consulting the oracle, why these individuals and states came to do it, and what they did. Uh, the history of Delphi, from a much more uh, historical lens, looking as well at its politics and uh, influence on Greek affairs, is uh, beautifully narrated in a recent book by Michael Scott, uh, which we'll draw on a little bit in what follows, including the discussion of the inspiration of the Pythia. But first I'll share just this lovely little bit of a description of what it was like that Scott suggests for a pilgrim to arrive. The appointed day had come. This, by the way, is a day in the month of Buzios in the spring, when Apollo has returned to the sanctuary and the Pythia will again give answers. Having journeyed up the winding mountain paths to the sanctuary hidden within the folds of the Parnassian mountains, imagine spring just breaking across Greece, individuals from near and far, cities, states, dynasties, kingdoms, all around the Mediterranean gathered in the sanctuary. As dawn broke, the word spread that it would soon be known whether the god Apollo was willing to respond to their questions. Uh, the Pythia didn't have to give answers, and it was usually just... Uh, one day, once in a while, when she was available. We'll talk about this a little bit later as well. So people might be eagerly waiting to find out. 
There's this beautiful description of the sunlight, the pause as everyone waits to see the oracle move into the inner sanctum, the consultants coming forward and wanting to know what the gods will say, waiting their turn. Some left content, others disappointed, most thoughtful. With dusk, the god's priestess fell silent. The crowds dispersed, heading to every corner of the ancient world, bringing with them the prophetic words of the oracle at Delphi. Okay, so what were these words like? We have a lot of literary sources. We have very little information about what the Pythia actually might have said in practice, although there's some reason to trust at least some of these sources. Um, and uh, the book that I mentioned before uh, that gives lists of these oracles is very helpful. Uh, some of them are more historically documented than others. Some of them are particularly famous in the literary record like this one from Herodotus, a uh, very early Greek historian, um, sometimes called the father of history in the 5th century BC, who documented the Greco-Persian War. Uh, according to this story, Croesus, a uh, major ruler in Lydia, uh, was putting oracles around the Mediterranean world to trial to see which one could tell the truth from afar. Uh, and his plan was to send his emissaries out to consult with all these different oracles on a very particular day, uh, many hundreds of miles from where Croesus himself was. And he would tell nobody what he was going to make for lunch. And then he was going to make lunch and get the emissaries far, far away to ask these oracles, what's Croesus having for lunch? And then if anybody got the right answer, he'd say, that's the oracle for me. So this is what the Pythia said at Delphi. I count the grains of sand on the beach. I measure the sea. I understand the speech of the dumb and hear the voiceless. The smell has come to my sense of a hard-shelled tortoise boiling and bubbling with a lamb's flesh in a bronze pot. The cauldron underneath it is of bronze, and bronze is the lid. This actually was what Croesus was having for lunch. So uh, it's a little unusual, admittedly. Uh, but she got this answer. So Croesus thought, that's the oracle for me. I'm going to keep asking questions of this oracle. So he next went to find out what will happen if he wages war against Persia. And the oracle said he would destroy a great empire. And he thought, great, that's exactly my plan. Destroy that Persian empire. Off he went. And of course, it was his own empire that he destroyed. Uh, this is a good example of the riddling or enigma-related character or, or sort of medium in which the Delphic oracles come, uh, especially in the literary record. Uh, and thus they partly help to give birth to a, a whole sort of practice of hermeneutics or interpretation. One of the famous examples of that interpretation is also narrated by Herodotus. Uh, the Athenians are about to face a large-scale invasion um, from the Persian invasion force led by uh, Xerxes I. They consult the uh, oracle at Delphi to find out what they can do, if anything, and the oracle says, a wall of wood alone shall be uncaptured, a boon to you and your children. Uh, so they spend some time thinking about this. The statesman Themistocles interprets the oracle on their view correctly that what the Pythia means is that they need to establish a naval force quickly to defend the city. The wall of wood is actually ships, and they do, and they win a decisive victory at sea. So who was the Pythia herself? Um, as we've talked about before, she was very likely an early presence at the site, uh, it is a lineage of women supported and protected by a class of priestesses and priests. So the Pythia would be selected uh, from a relatively early age from a family at Delphi, not necessarily a noble or wealthy family, but usually selected quite young. Uh, in the early years, in later years, often an elder woman who had led a family life, uh, and in either case would usually act as a maiden or parthenos. Early on, the Pythia might have been a priestess of Gaia, and then later a priestess of Apollo, if we follow that mythic sequence. The uh, practice, or the actual work of the Pythia, we have very little writing about, other than the experience of the consultants. It was preserved almost solely as an oral tradition that was passed down between the women who performed the role. 
Uh, at the height of the oracle's power, though, we know that at least three Pythias served, or so the Platonist philosopher Plutarch tells us, one central Pythia and, uh, sorry, two central Pythias and one understudy. The consultation process itself ran something like this. So on the seventh day of the lunar month, in the month of Busios, we're around the beginning of spring and running through winter. So these are the months when Apollo is present at the sanctuary before he leaves to join the Hyperboreans at the supposed edges of the earth and Dionysus takes his place. That's your time to consult. That means basically once a month for those months when Apollo is present, it's possible to ask the Pythia a question. In those days, when she is answering a question during those months, she bathes at dawn in the Castalian Spring, which is legendarily associated with this sort of cleansing spiritually and, and in embodiment. Returning to the sanctuary, she burns offerings of laurel leaves and barley meal to Apollo and local deities. Um, you might remember from the Homeric hymn to Apollo this mention of, uh, of offering barley meal up to the god, uh, possibly looking back to some earlier practices, certainly familiar for the historical Greeks as well. The priests uh, verify with the Pythia that the day is suitable for consultation. There's a ritual process for this, which may also have made it possible for the Pythia to decline to consult if she wished. The consultants also go through a process of ritual purification, and they queue up in a way that's organized by the Delphians, and they offer the, uh, the so-called Pelinos. Uh, so the Pelinos is a sort of uh, handy cake that can be offered to the god in return for the oracle that's about to be received. Um, it also will cost a little bit to get a Pelinos to offer, and this is actually pretty much the way that Delphi supports itself, is through the offerings made by pilgrims who come to consult the Pythia. For a major state inquiry, uh, as we know from uh, evidence from about uh, 402 BC, it would cost about seven drachmas and two obols, for a private inquiry about four opals, that's just 10%, uh, and it seems like there was a sort of sliding scale. So for people who couldn't afford as much, uh, they wouldn't have to pay as much. For a little bit of uh, context, jury pay in Athens, so sort of like basic, uh, pretty low level pay, um, was two or three opals a day. Uh, so that means that a private inquiry um, that's about four obols, maybe a little less for people without a lot of money. That equates to about a, a kind of minimal wage day's pay, uh, depending on the time. Uh, there's six obols in a drachma, so a state inquiry costs about 45 obols, uh, and that maybe helps to get a little bit of a feeling for the numbers we're talking about. Uh, very large and wealthy states would be charged more. Generally, pilgrims would come through the sacred way imaged here to consult uh, the Pythia at the temple and to make their offerings. So we know a little bit about this process as well, or at least we think we do from some of these literary sources. We're told that the consultants would wait at the shelter against the north wall of the temple terrace and make a second offering in the inner hearth of the temple. This would usually be an, an important food supply for the city of Delphi, the pilgrims who would make these offerings. The consultant would then move toward the Pythia and be encouraged by the priests to think pure thoughts and speak well-omened words. We also have this evidence from Plutarch several hundred years after the classical period. And the Pythia herself would then give her prophecies from the Adaton or Holy of Holies of the Temple. Maybe during this time, inquirers wait in the Megaron or Oikos, whatever these words mean. We haven't quite figured out what everything corresponds to in the plan of the Temple. But it does seem likely from literary sources in Euripides and Herodotus, both in the classical period, 5th century, that consultants could hear what the Pythia was saying. So uh, that sort of um, runs against a theory that has sometimes been suggested that the priests were maybe just making it up, um, because how could this um, apparently irrational and ecstatic person say something intelligible? Rather, uh, that doesn't seem quite right. It does seem likely that people could actually hear her and were moved by what she said. Uh, this again, just for a sense of context, is the plan of the temple. The Adaton is where the Pythia is sitting on her tripod. According to early sources, we have some ideas about how the tripod uh, and the uh, laurel and um, the mirror or whatever it is the Pythia holds in some of the traditional representations uh, and her cries 
how it all hangs together. So according to these sources, she sits on the tripod and utters cries or boai while holding a laurel branch, which she can shake for purification or inspiration and wearing a crown of bay leaves. Later, we're back to Diodorus Siculus, by the way, you might remember from our last conversation and Plutarch. This is hundreds of years after the classical period by the first century, but we hear that she's sitting atop a kind of chasm from which a certain pneuma or vapor rises from the ground. After the consultation, whatever was in this vapor uh, is sometimes suggested to relate to the state of mind the Pythia finds herself in, which Plutarch describes as calm and peaceful. Uh, but there's also questions about whether, uh, of course, although people are very interested in the vapor, whether this vapor actually has anything to do with the process or not, or whether it's a later suggestion to explain it. Roman Christian and modern readers have focused a lot on the source of this vapor or the interpretive role of the priests. Again, it does seem clear that the Pythia spoke intelligibly and could be heard by the consultant. Um, there might even have been some misunderstanding of this process via Latin. Uh, in Latin, the Greek word mantike was often translated as insania or insane, which has quite a different flavor from the Greek mania that Plato connects with the mantic or prophetic art, which can mean a kind of divine madness uh, and a state of ecstasy or transformed consciousness, but not necessarily um, insanity. Uh, although we can uh, certainly think a bit more about how the meaning of all those words are constructed and maybe problematic uh, both for us and in trying to retroject into the past. But here's a little bit about how this has been understood uh, since, again following some of the account in Scott's recent book. When Delphi was excavated in the 1890s, there was a huge amount of excitement about psychic phenomena. Uh, so for example, in 1891, uh, there was a Broadway play, Apollo or the Oracle at Delphi. Um, the painting I've been showing you throughout uh, these uh, slides was painted then. Uh, the Cambridge Society of Psychical Research published its first volume, and it was about the oracle. So this kind of idea of mediums and access to spirits was really interesting, even in the kind of scientific academic world at the time when these excavations were ongoing. And of course, people really wanted to find this chasm below the Temple of Apollo and understand how the Pythia was inspired in a more kind of materialistic way. They didn't find a chasm below the temple, spoiler alert, uh, and they felt sort of cheated by the deception of the sources. Then some of these other theories proliferated. So for example, in the Journal of Hellenic Studies in 1904, one scholar argued that maybe this was some pretty fancy sham work or a kind of confidence trick by the priests at Delphi. Uh, one notable professor tried eating laurel leaves to see if that might have caused the Pythia's transformation of consciousness and very carefully and meticulously noted a disappointing lack of effect of the laurel leaves. Um, other scholars argued in the 1950s that there was a kind of self-induced hypnosis. Um, we also have access to many more helpful anthropological theoretical tools today to understand how um, mediums, trances, and oracles work in other cultures, for example, in Tibetan culture. Um, also, speaking of this chasm and its vapor, uh, there was a pretty good point that was offered later in the 20th century that the chasm that Plutarch described in the first century, hundreds of years after the classical period, was already closing in his own time. So it might easily have been closed by the 19th century. Uh, so then no wonder it wasn't found by the French in the 19th century, even though they were looking so hard for it. There was also the perfectly reasonable suggestion by Holland in 1933 that the Pythia might have let hemp below the tripod, and perhaps that might help to understand the phenomenon as well. Uh, other scholarly ideas, uh, fast forwarding a little to the 1980s and 90s, um, this is kind of cool and also sparked some uh, interesting press, uh, an example in the New York Times here on screen. Um, there is evidence for two major geological fault lines, one east-west and one north-south, crossing at Delphi right under the Temple of Apollo. Uh, and if this is right, which it seems to be, 
um, these scholars uh, bringing together geological information uh, with some of the historical and archaeological sources argued that fissured bedrock under the temple might have allowed gas from limestone to rise into the temple. Um, some tests showed that ethylene as well as ethane and methane uh, were found in the water beneath the temple. Ethylene had been used as an anesthetic in the 1920s so, hey presto, maybe that was what the vapor and inspiration were all about. But there's also some doubts about this, insp uh, this interpretation. So, uh, just for example, uh, apparently ethylene smells horrible, and the impression of consultants at the temple was of uh, absolutely delightful smell from the vapor, so it seems somewhat unlikely to be ethylene. Uh, the effects of, in effect, a sort of laughing gas um, for a dentist's anesthetic doesn't seem to have led to a great many oracles in the 1920s. Uh, so reasons to think that's somewhat unlikely. We can also consider that if we were reflecting on uh, these different states of mind due to uh, hallucinogenic substances or other entheogens, there's lots of other options. In the Eleusinian mysteries, um, there's suggestions of different uh, mushrooms or the parasitization of barley. Uh, that might have been part of the Kukeon of Demeter that helped the initiates at Eleusis to see what they saw uh, in the, the process of the initiation. Um, we don't know if, if that is in fact what happened, but it's a, a popular, understandably popular hypothesis. Uh, so certainly we don't necessarily need to resort to the ethylene hypothesis, though the evidence for the bedrock is pretty interesting and compelling. Uh, we can also note that all this, right back to antiquity, back to the Roman and, and Christian somewhat polemical take on the oracle, is sort of designed to try to reduce what the Pythia is doing to these materialistic terms. Uh, and in fact, again, reflecting on some of the anthropological perspectives we have from, from other cultures, so far as they can be compared, it might be more interesting to just take seriously what was happening in the temple without resorting to those materialistic explanations without resorting to the explanation that the vapor alone must have been effective. In any case, the oracle was tremendously successful for over 1500 years. There were certainly some doubts uh, about oracles in general in antiquity, but Delphi especially had an extraordinary prestige and there was broad acceptance that these institutions worked. Uh, and again, whatever the material or cultural or spiritual or uh, psychological explanations for the way that the states were experienced phenomenologically, they were ubiquitous in the Greek world. Uh, in one quote, there is a constant hum of divine communication throughout that whole world, even though Delphi was the most successful. So it remains a bit of a mystery just how the Pythia did this, how it came to be that for hundreds of years, not only Greeks, but Romans and uh, consultants from the Middle East and uh, much further in the West and uh, Italy came to ask these questions and found the answers so meaningful. But it was a really important institution throughout all that story, and as we'll see, important as well in the foundation of the polis or the city-state. I'd like to close this review of Delphi thinking a little bit about more explicitly the philosophy of the oracle, if we can use that language here, which I think we probably can. Um, there's a number of sayings associated with Epithea. We've looked at these number of times like, know thyself. Uh, and uh, this saying is often attributed to one of the seven sages, and also in a tradition that Pausanias reports uh, attributed to Phaemonoe, the first of the Epithei. These are some of the other examples we've looked at uh, and explored. Uh, the sincerity recommendation to Cicero, uh, the encouragement to Socrates to interrogate, uh, at least as Socrates himself understood it, the tradition as well that some of the philosophers like Pythagoras, who we'll be talking about soon, uh, studied with the Pythia at Delphi, uh, some of the ways that, that Socrates himself tried to understand this injunction to self-knowledge as somehow the primary step in philosophy, because if only we could get to know ourselves, then we might be able to understand how to cultivate ourselves. But all of this is about the kind of cultural memory of the oracle and of Delphi. 
We also have a number of these Delphic maxims, uh, which are brief, laconic, pithy sorts of sayings uh, attributed to the Pythia as well as the seven sages and associated with the site that ancient educators uh, hundreds of years later encourage students to copy and reflect on uh, fairly often. One helpful literary source for the maxims is, again, quite a bit later, Stobius in his anthology. Um, but we've also found some of the concluding sayings carved into a tomb in modern Afghanistan uh, and dated back to the 3rd century BC. Some of these are in the Delphic philosophy reader associated with this series. And I'll just give you a few examples. Of course, again, the most famous is to know thyself. But here's some more. Be for the common good. Help out your friends. Honor the home. When you know, do. Be grateful. Think like a mortal. Choose divinely. Recognize the essential moment, the kairos moment. Hate hubris. You might remember hubris as that kind of overweening arrogance, trampling on the dignity and needs of the less well-off, those who deserve honor, or the gods. Uh, share the load of those who are less fortunate. Um, when you're a guest, Act it. Listen to everybody. Fear power. That is your own. If you have power, be afraid. Be kind to everyone. Become a philosopher. That is a wisdom lover. Nothing too much. Made in agon. Do no violence. No bia. No kind of uh, force in excess. Here's some of the most poignant of the last of these maxims. Pison cosmios is the as a child, be cosmios. This is hard to translate, uh, but something like uh, orderly or fine. Uh, it's also the word behind our cosmos, which is a world order. As a youth, hey bone and crates, keep control. Mesos di chaos. As an adult, be just. Presbutes elogos. As an elder, speak wisely or give good counsel. Telotone alupos, at the end, be without sorrow. So, we've spent a little bit of time talking about the cultural memory of Delphi and the Panhellenic polis. Uh, in the next discussion, we're going to focus more on specific cases of polis influenced by Delphi, at least again in literary sources. Uh, we've talked about Delphi and Greek myth, the site of Delphi, the process of consulting the oracle, and just a few snapshots of Delphic philosophy and ideas. No sons <laughs>